we kind of alluded, we kind of reached on the topic, you know, of, we just spoke a little bit about the tendonitis last night, okay? So, um, with people that have tendonitis, anyone in here want to share if they have tendonitis or history of tendonitis? You've seen people Your sister have it. So what does does she present with? Like what kinds of complaints or symptoms? If you want to share, you don't have to go. Pain. So it's up here. She types like and she types the rest of the like she rests in extension. Right. So she's like Yeah. Bad. Yeah. 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 I need her class, ergonomic class with her. Right. So pain would be a symptom. Okay. Yeah, and tightness here is tight. Tightness would be a complaint. You can almost feel like this bump. The muscle feels bumpy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or we would call that like fibrosis? Like when the muscle changes its texture, like usually our muscle will lie down in nice, neat little rows, and when it gets irritated, they kind of all bundle up into jibbled, you know, all mis disorganized, and then if it feels lumpy, like a, you might, like you have marbles or a small ball in your muscle, like you know, as people say I had a big knot. You know, all you students are carrying those backpacks. You know, I've got a big knot up here, or you're typing like this, right? Knots or fibrosis in the muscle. Yeah. So pain, um, tightness. Um, muscle changes. What else might people complain of? Well, I had um, lateral epicondylitis before, and it felt mm -hmm. like burning. Burning. Uh huh. Yeah. Do you think your symptoms would be worse in the morning or at night? Okay. At night, because an itis it's from doing things. So in the morning you might feel rested, but um, but. At night, after you worked all day or you did a lot of tasks, it, so activity would irritate it or increase your symptoms, right? But then there's exceptions to every rule, right? Because we have like the TMJ people, right? The st high stress people that grit their teeth at night, right? And have to wear the bite guards and um, all that. Those patients also frequently squeeze their hands at night when they sleep too. So even though they're sleeping, their body is working like crazy, right? So they might wake up with morning pain if they're that type of personality, you know? Like they have, they're, they're, they already are clenching their teeth all night. Those muscles are working while they're sleeping. They frequently squeeze and grip their hands all night too. Very bold, but can happen. So, so general presentation with tendonitis, symptoms worse at night. You can palpate these muscle changes. You guys got them all. It's a soft tissue injury, so it's not going to show up on an x-ray. X-ray, just bone would show up, or a gap, or something other that would be pathological. But a soft tissue inflammation is not going to show up. It would show up on things like a CT scan or an MRI, but it's not going to show up on an x-ray. Because people will say, well, I had an x-ray and everything was good. Well, it doesn't show. It doesn't show on the x-ray. Um, and, and we all do things like, you know, it's January and we're going to get in shape. And so I joined the gym and I was a little eager, right? And then the next morning I go to get out of bed and I can't move, right? It's hard to go downstairs. You know, all that kind of stuff that when you go to the gym or lift or push things, you feel pain, right? That's like a little bit of a tendonitis. We inflamed, we itis the muscle, we irritated, we overdid it. But then the next, the next day it might feel worse, but then the next day it starts to feel a little bit better and, and we overcome it, right? Because we're healthy. And I might do a job when I might start it when I'm like 23, where I'm working in an assembly plant where I have to keep flipping things flipping things, flipping things, and I'm fine because I'm 23 and I'm healthy and everything. And then I'm 36 and I start to have pain and it's not really going away. And then I keep doing it and then I'm 48 and I can't stand it anymore. Burning, right? 
So, and as we age, our circulation goes down, so we can't bounce back from that kind of stuff. You know, so now I'm 65 and I decided to um, put in, like take out my whole backyard and put in a perennial garden, right? I might get tendinitis because now I'm at an age where my muscles don't heal as well because I'm older and my circulation is down. And I might have other things like diabetes or brain nods or other things that impact my ability to heal and recover from things. So, so some people, you know, get an itis and then it calms down, then it can become chronic. Okay? Another thing that happens when a muscle gets irritated is that um, the muscles don't like to lengthen. I don't know what that noise is, Mark. I was doing really it weird. last night and I have no idea what that is. But it's periodic, so it might inhibit your recording. <laughs> All right. Um, muscles that are irritated don't like to lengthen and they don't like to shorten. So when muscles are irritated, you lose range of motion and you lose strength. And why do you think we lose strength with itises? Is it because we're atrophy? Because it hurts. No, it's because it hurts. I go to do something and it hurts, so I stop. I stop squeezing, I can't do it, right? So the itis causes the muscle to change, become fibrotic, doesn't like to lengthen, doesn't like to shorten, okay? We're all good? Okay, now we're going to move on to some diagnosis. We're going to talk about lateral epicondylitis and medial epicondylitis. Okay, the first thing is the big debate. Is it an itis or is it an osis? Okay, an itis is something more recent. I did something like shoveled snow because we got, God forbid, you know, a foot of snow or something and I had to go out and shovel my driveway. I come in, my arm is hurting, my shoulder, something. I have an itis, it's inflamed, it's acute, right? If um, we had a horrible winter and I kept doing that over and over and over again for three months, right? It become, might become more chronic and become an osis or in that factory example that I used. Someone working in assembly that keeps doing the same repetitive thing over and over and over again they have inflammation and then they keep doing it over and over and over again. It turns into an osis where you have degeneration of the tissue. We have um, scarring that occurs around the site and it becomes more of an osis. So here's the big problem. If you look at the literature on both medial and lateral epicondylitis, it does not show favorable results of any interaction with OT or PT. I've been in the clinic with a physician where he says things like, uh, you have lateral epicondylitis, and there's no uh, research that shows that any therapy is effective. So um, I could do surgery, but there's only like a 65% success rate with surgical release for epicondylitis. So you just have to do these stretches and modify your activity and live with it. So, um, yeah. I had a see I do iontophoresis on it. What's that? Iontophoresis on the... Yeah, yeah. we're going to talk about the treatment. But there's no, no support in the literature. Mm. Right. But if you think about it, did they, did they know for sure all the people that they were evaluating if they were at the itis or the osis? Did they take out anyone that had symptoms longer? That, are people good, true reports of really when their symptoms started? Did they know for sure? Like my dad, who could hardly walk with the stupid knee, he, we went to the doctor this year, and the doctor, or the 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 pre um, pre op consultant, and the, the doctor asked him, "Well, how long have you been having these symptoms in your knees?" Oh, two years. That's baloney. Twenty years. Add a zero to that. So mm -hmm. even if we screened people, would we even get reports to know for sure? Well, when did the irritation actually begin? We're not going to open people's arms up and see is there inflammatory tissue or do a $600 MRI on everyone before we put them in a research project to study if iontophoresis is helpful with um, epicondylitis, right? 
So research does not support it, but from my experience, I've seen benefit in some cases, not benefit in others. So, but what do you think that kind of impact that surgeon's opinion makes on our field of motif? Bad, right? Therapy's not gonna help, right? But it's this whole osis-itis debate. Okay, so we learned about those extrinsic extensor muscles yesterday, right? So the main culprit with lateral epicondylitis are our wrist extensors, right? Extensor carpi radialis brevis, or ECRB, and the secondary is the longest, extensor carpi radialis longus, and then also those digit extensors, the EDC that extends our MP joints. All those extensors that cross over and make this big extensor rod, because remember where they start? On our lateral epicondyle, right? This is why you have to know the anatomy, right? They start on our lateral epicondyle. So we probably don't think about the phases of fisting, like what happens when we fist. And I don't know if I ever talked to the grandpa's class about this, but I don't think I did last night to you guys. But when we make a fist, what actually happens first is our wrist extensors contract. So if I were to ask you probably, what do you think the first muscle that contracts when you make a fist, you'd probably either say that those digit flexors, FDP, FDS, right? But it's not. Your wrist extensor contracts first, then a EDC, we move into a hook, and then we go down into a fist. If we were to break down slow motion, what happens with a fist, that's what would happen. Wrist extends, MP extension, hook, and then a fist, okay? So every time I grip something, the first muscle that I contract are the ones that can, are the contributors to lateral epicondylitis, right? So repetitive gripping, is bad, right? So if I were to grip this bottle, would I want to pick it up this way, this way, or this way if I had lateral epicondylitis? What would be the best way? Use your other hand. Use your other hand. <laughs> that would be the better way, yeah? <laughs> but maybe I'm a double-fisted drinker, right? So, which <laughs> on top is going to use my extensors. They're already itis. Use your flexor group. So modify activity to let those muscles rest. Right? If you're a PT, you can strengthen them. But if it's an itis, what do you think that's going to do? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think. But if you look at some of the research out there, then they, when they study, that was done by PT, on lateral epicondylitis, if you look at the exercises they did, they take a weight. Look at the research out there. And then they show that it didn't work. Therapy didn't work. So bad, th bad research hurts our field, right? Um, so those are the culprits, wrist extensors. The symptoms, pain at the lateral epicondyle or that extensor wad or extensor muscle mass because fibrosis changes occur, or fibrotic changes occur in the muscle, right? Feels lumpy, bumpy. Um, pain with gripping and lifting because the first muscle that, that contracts when I grip are my wrist extensors, which are the culprit for lateral epicondylitis. And this could be from one single night where I did a lot of work at something, or it could be from a repetitive task that happens over time where finally my muscle says, that's enough. I'm done. I'm giving you pain. I'm changing your muscle conformation. <laughs> We're not doing this anymore, right? And it becomes a more chronic problem, okay? All right, so those are the symptoms that are associated with it. With every diagnosis, or most diagnoses that we talk about in this class, we're going to talk about differential diagnosis. In OT, we do not diagnose patients, right? But we get referrals that say things like elbow pain, right? I may get a script from a family doctor that says elbow pain. 
I can't just do things for elbow pain. I have to figure out, okay, what muscle is the root or the cause of the pain? I'm not diagnosing problems, but I have to figure out what is causing the pain. The doctor diagnosed it as pain. Just like you might get a script from a doctor that says uh, left hemiplegia. Right? That's a symptom, but it's a diagnosis, just like left elbow pain, right? What could the root of left hemiplegia be? Probably a stroke. Could be a stroke. What else? Um, could be a traumatic brain injury. What else? Like an no. CP? Do CP kids get hemiplegia? Like congenital. Could be CP. Could be a brain tumor. Right? We don't get the diagnosis, we get that they have left hemiplegia. The same thing happens in hand therapy. We're not diagnosing them, we're trying to get at the root to find out what's going on. So we have to look at other diagnoses that, that are similar or mimic symptoms to lateral epicondylitis so we can figure out what's what. Okay? Radial tunnel. Remember we showed the radial nerve yesterday, right? And it had that motor branch that comes down here, right? The radial nerve dives underneath our supinator muscle, okay? And people get pain in the smack dab of their extensor wad, where our supinator muscle is, right? So people may complain, oh, they go to the doctor, oh, my arm, it hurts right here. And then, you know, the first thing they think of is, oh, you got, right, you got lateral epicondylitis, let's send you to therapy, right? But it might be radial tunnel syndrome, which is the radial nerve, which we're going to go over nerves later, the radial nerve gets squished by the supinator muscle, okay? So how we would rule that out is by doing a long finger test, okay? Or you could call it a resistive long finger test. Hold the patient, have the patient hold their arm out like this. Simple, simple, simple. Have them hold their finger up and resist long finger extension. Okay? If your patient says, it hurts right here, smack dab in the middle of the forearm, right there, pinpoint. It hurts all over here. That's not pinpoint. It hurts right here. That's positive long finger test or positive resistive long finger test, which is positive for radial tunnel syndrome, okay? If you do this and they say, oh, that hurts back here at the epicondyle, that's not radial tunnel. That just confirms that they probably have lateral epicondylitis, right? But if you resist here and it hurts right there, radial tunnel, which is a motor nerve no sensory loss. Remember how we talked about last night, the radial nerve motor branch goes down and there's a little sensory branch that comes off. This is only motor. We're going to talk about nerves later, but um, only um, weakness, no numbness with that. So that's radial tunnel syndrome. Yeah, question for you? They might all have it too, so I just must ask it. So, pain here and here indicates right Not here, only there. You resist there. I'm just resisting there, and it hurts right there. And it's a pinpoint. It's not a, oh, that kind of hurts all over, or oh, that really hurts up here. That's not positive. It has to be there, right there. They'll point to it. Oh, that hurts right there. They'll point to it. They feel it. Okay? Okay. So, presentation with the lateral epicondylitis. We talked about that muscles don't like to lengthen and shorten when they're itis, right? So, you're going to probably have limitations in that wrist motion. You might have tightness of the extensors, those extrinsic extensors, which would be extrinsic tightness of the extensors, which we learned how to measure that 
remember, by making a fist and having them try to, which puts those extensors on their maximum stretch, right? You would test that. They're going to have decreased grip, not because they're weak, probably, but it hurts, right? Um, tenderness at that epicondyle or when you palpate that extensor wad, it's going to be tender, really tender. Um, I might do a manual muscle test with them, not to see really how strong they are, but to see if I resist their wrist extensors and they say, oh, that really hurts right there. That helps me confirm, yeah, I'm on the right track. Because a lot of times we're like on this investigative, trying to figure out what the source is. So I might do a manual muscle test to wrist extensors or to supination to see if it provokes pain. And I'm going to document if they couldn't tolerate my resistance, that's going to be, you know, a three, right? Or if they don't have full motion, it would be a two, you know, or two plus or a three minus, you know. Um, and then I'm going to say that they have a negative long finger test, right? Because if they had a positive, then they could have epicondylitis and radial tunnel syndrome. They could have both, right? Everyone clear on the symptoms? You got it? Okay. All right. So, um, now, I thought I had treatment right after. Must be after both. Okay. Medial epicondylitis is the same thing, but on the opposite side of the hand. Those extrinsic flexors. Okay? So this would be called, sometimes they call it golfer's elbow. Just like with lateral epicondylitis, they'll call it tennis elbow. You might even just get the script, if it's from a family doc, tennis elbow. So you need to know that that is lateral epicondylitis, golfer's elbow, is medial. And those, the root of the medial epicondylitis would be the pronator, and then those wrist flexors that we talked about, remember? And it may also, um, so the radial wrist flexors, and it may also cause, be involved with the, the ulnar wrist flexor and our finger flexor, the superficialis, okay? But again, medial epicondylitis is an itis of the flexors, the flexor pronator group, right? And lateral epicondylitis is a problem with the, those extrinsic extensors. Because all those muscles, remember we talked about, they start at the epicondyle. So what happens is, with epicondylitis, I'll just draw lateral because it's easier to describe. I have my insertion point on that epicondyle. It comes down, forms these muscle bellies, right? Goes back to tendon, goes under that retinaculum, it goes up into the hand to extend the wrist, right? The muscle contracts to bring my wrist into extension and it pulls at that origin site. The pulls here, and it pulls here to pull my wrist up, right? So that's why that gets inflamed. It pulls up on that muscle. Okay, I wish I had a clicker. Um, so the same symptoms, pain at the medial elbow, problems with gripping, problems with motion, and a lot of times this can be because of um, a sport activity, um, like improper technique, improper handle, that kind of thing. Another thing with the medial epicondylitis is you can't really feel as much those fibrotic muscle changes when you palpate that flexor wad as you can with the extensor wad. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but if I palpate my extensor wad, it feels really needy, but I am like a, a little bit of a worker bee. If I palpate my flexor wad, does it feel as needy? But think about every time you grip. You would think you would use your flexors, flexors, but you use your extensor so much for things, when we grip things for lifting. Did you see the view? Okay, so limits and range of motion, same type of thing. 
extrinsic tightness of the flexors. Maybe they can't go back all the way this way. And we're going to talk about extrinsic tightness. Problems in grip strength. I might do a manual muscle test to see if that provokes pain in wrist flexion and forearm pronation to see if it provokes pain at my, and I'm going to document that if it creates pain. Um, pain with palpation to the flexor wad and pain with palpation to that medial epicondyle. Okay, so we know the difference between lateral and medial epicondylitis, their presentation, what they're going to look like, right? One's the flexor group, one's the extensor group. Again, everything has a differential diagnosis. Um, we're going to talk about nerves later, but I'm just bringing this up as a differential diagnosis. Because right here at our elbow, you know how when you say, oh, I just hit my funny bone, right? That's actually your ulnar nerve. And I think cubital tunnel was one of the diagnoses for case-based that you learned. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, when patients go to a family doctor, they have to know their Coumadin levels, they have to know about dialysis, they have to know liver function, they have to know everything, right? They have el a patient with medial elbow pain, the more, most common thing is epicondylitis, they send you to therapy. That's why we have to just look at the root and make sure anything else isn't maybe going on. So it could be an ulnar nerve problem. What would be different if they had ulnar nerve problems versus epicondylitis? Um, might be sensation. 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 They would have sensory loss with, with ulnar nerve problem, not with epicondylitis. Right? So that could be my way to, to figure out what the root in my investigation, right? What's causing it. And remember we talked about ligaments. The ligaments keep our joints from going ways they should not go. Right? And if I'm not a sports person, but if you throw a baseball or a softball and you go back and you huge external rotation and puts a lot of pressure on my medial collateral ligament of the elbow. Right? It could be a medial collateral ligament problem. But I'm already going to be thinking that if my patient comes to me and she's uh, 20 years old and she's played uh, softball since she was four, t-ball, softball, now she's playing in college, They've been, she's been practicing like crazy, now she's having all this medial elbow pain. That's what I'm going to be worried about, ligament, right? But typically with people not in sports or doing things that would be provocative, it would be an, a medial elbow pain problem, a medial ligament problem. So how would I check if it's medial collateral ligament versus epicondylitis? What could I look for? What would show up with that versus epicondylitis? What do ligaments do? Hold bones together. Hold bones together. So how do I know if it's not holding the bone together? It's going to be loose. I might try to move it. Sorry, Kyle. Um, I might try check for laxity, right? Hold it this way and really check for laxity and compare it to the other side. Feels, see if it feels loosey-goosey. Right? If it does, there might be in problems with the integrity of the medial collateral ligament. I can't diagnose that, but I can check it. And if I have concern, I can call the doctor. And I'm not going to say, oh, I think this patient has a problem with their medial collateral ligament. I'll say, you know, I'm seeing so-and-so. You referred them for medial elbow pain. They have a long history of softball. And when I check their elbow, they have laxity at the joint. That's what I'm going to say. Right? If I call the doctor and I say, hey, you sent so-and-so for me to elbow pain, and now she has laxity at her elbow. I think she tore her, her medial collateral ligament. You're never getting another patient from that doctor again. Miss know-it-all. Right? <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not conducive to a good working relationship. So, don't do that. All right. So, treatment for, that we've already talked about, the research does not support. The research does not support this, okay? Um, a wrist control splint. Why do you think I would put someone in a wrist control splint for medial or lateral epicondylitis? Because it's 
yeah. to rest it so that they stop using it, and like stop stressing the tendons? Right, to rest it. But what, what do I want to rest? What's the culprit with these, with the primary culprit with both of these diagnoses? The extrinsic, the extrinsic wrist muscles. So I need to immobilize the extrinsic wrist muscles. And in some cases, I've immobilized more. Like, I had recently had a patient that was a musician, and he, well, he was a guitar player, and he was having medial epicondylitis. And if you remember the slide, it's those primary the wrist, the radial wrist flexors, right? But it also could be the ulnar wrist flexors, and it also could be the digit flexors, right? Well, his was really inflamed, and I don't play guitar, but I know that you're like, really flexing your wrist and then you're holding prolonged with your fingers so I made him a resting hand splint for night right he ended up hanging it and went back to the wrist cock up but I tried it right because I thought it made sense for him because of the task that he was doing but a wrist control splint counter force strap do anyone know what a counter force strap is is that like for blocking it's 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 kind of I mean it depends on what you consider blocking it's a strap, I'm sure you've seen sports players, where they put it over the muscle belly, oh, okay? It's got that little air pocket in it. They could have an air pocket in it, it could be a bandit where it's like a hard uh, splint with black on the inside, it's white on the outside, and you strap it down. And you put it over this muscle belly to trick it that it doesn't go all the way to the end. Counter force, takes the force off the origin site of the flexor or the extensor. To wear it properly, I see it worn improperly all the time when I'm just out in the community. Two fingers away from the elbow crease, and then the strap. So you don't want to wear it down here, right? You don't want to wear it over the elbow. I see people that will just wear like those neoprene or like a, some kind of um, elbow pad for epicondylitis. You need to counter force the pull. Just uh, where are you counter forcing again? I'm just, I wasn't. Oh, the muscle belly. So the you muscle want to belly. put it over that that wad, that either the extensor wad or the flexor wad. So if there's an air pocket, like someone said, if it's epicondylitis lateral, you want to put it over the extensor muscles. If it's medial, you want to put it over the flexor muscles. If it's the bandit, it's got both compression on both sides, so you can't really do it wrong. Well, you could wear it the wrong distance on the forearm, but two fingers from the elbow crease, distal. Okay. What about if my patient has a positive long finger test? Would I want to use a counterforce strap? No, because there's already too much pressure on the nerve. You don't want to use it. So that's a really important reason why if you have a patient with epicondylitis, you better check for radial nerve compression because you could be making the person worse by recommending a counterforce strap. It's really important, right? The patient may create their own radial tunnel because they've had this problem for 10 years and they keep, it feels better when I tighten down that counterforce strap and they keep tightening it and tightening it and they create their own radial tunnel syndrome, right? So then we wanna make sure that we, um, that we, uh, Stop using that and just use the wrist cock up. From my experience with the counterforce straps, they either help or they don't. So if your patient tries it and they're not seeing any difference, and they're, they should be used correctly when the patient is doing activity. If you're going to sit and watch a movie for two hours at the theater, take it off. Because unless you're lifting a big gulp all the time, you know, but you don't want if you, you don't want pressure over that radial nerve if you don't need it. So take it off if you're not working on something. Okay. Um, activity modification. So if you have lateral epicondylitis, you're going to want to modify it so you use your flexor group. And then the opposite if you have medial epicondylitis, modify activity. Like I had a patient that. She was working in an office one time and she had these giant three ring binders that were like three inches big and they were filled with paper and in her job she kept having to pull them out of a drawer and then get them out and then put them back in the drawer. It's like change how they're in the drawer. Put them on the shelf this way so that you're pulling them off instead of lifting them out, you know. 
Your, people don't know how to modify the activity. They don't know the culprit. So we have to tell them or educate them. Proximal strengthening. Um, sometimes, remember how we said if you don't have proximal stability, you won't have distal function? So someone could have a shoulder pathology or scapular weakness, and then they have to work harder down here to do tasks. So a lot of times, I always screen the whole upper quadrant, but I'll find big weakness, proximal, and then I'll strengthen that. I don't strengthen their wrist extensors, because to me, that just seems wrong. It's itis right? So I rest those, I stretch those, I strengthen what is weak. So I investigate further up, more proximal, and strengthen that. Even if you look at your posture, and if you sit like in a very poor way right now, like you can try it right now, like round your shoulders, arch, close to your till, maybe you're already sitting like that. <laughs> I have bad posture, it's not one to talk. But go into that bad posture and then try to squeeze your fingers. Squeeze a nice strong fist. What we should do is we should do a study and check all your grip strength when you're in this bad posture way. And then sit up nice and tall, feet in the ground, anterior tilt of your pelvis, shoulders back, and grip. Do you feel how much stronger you are when you're solid? So when people have bad posture, they're not doing things right. These muscles have to work harder, right? So educate them on that. Cardio activity, because if I increase my cardio activity, get my whole circulation more, then I get an improved healing. So get your patients out, like not in the clinic. They don't need to come to the clinic and pay $42 for a 15 minute time to walk on the treadmill or do an upper body bike. Have them do that at home. That's not skilled, right? Have them start doing something at home to get their overall body circulation up. Soft tissue mobilization. Remember, we don't do massage in OT. We're not massage therapists, right? So, but we can help to normalize that muscle fibrosis. So, using some lotion and putting pressure over those lumpy bumpies, okay? So, sorry, Cal's not going to sit here next weekend. Um, um, so, follow, follow my thumb along that extensor wad, and if I find a spot, Kyle's arm feels good, let's feel yours, because you said you had that all. So, so, I might find a point like right there. Does that feel tender to you? No? Oh, okay. Right there. Right there? Yeah. <laughs> so, and his face is turned low, right? <laughs> so, I'm going to put pressure over that, okay? And, and, and try to normalize that tissue. Soft tissue mobilization. And then stretching. So, if we were to go all run, right? If we're like runners, and we're going to go run three miles after class, right? I don't just take off running, right? I stretch, I do all these stretches, right? Then I walk a little bit, and then I run, and then I walk to cool off, and then I stretch, right? But if I'm gonna shovel snow, do I stretch? No, I just go shovel snow. If I'm gonna haul groceries, think about how much work hauling groceries is. I have family of five. <laughs> you get all the food in the cart, then you got to put the food off the cart onto the conveyor belt, then you got to put the food in the conveyor belt. Hopefully, if you have someone well, admire you always self-checkout, you got to put it in the bags, then move the bags from there to the cart, move the cart, move the bags from the cart to the car, then from the car to the house, then put everything away, and then you're reorganizing. It's a lot of work for the arms. Do we stretch before we do that? We know. <laughs> our muscles work the same way as in our legs, but we don't give them the same respect. And smaller muscles get itis easier than bigger muscles. So why don't we stretch our smaller muscles? Why don't we respect our arms? So educating patients to do this. Epicondyle stretch is really just 
stretching those extrinsic wrist extensors. This would be if you have lateral epicondylitis. This would be if you have medial epicondylitis. Okay? And don't do this. It puts too much pressure on the metacarpals here. Okay? This is for medial? This is for medial. Just think about it. It's logical, right? I want to elongate my flexors for medial epicondylitis. So I would stretch them this way. I want to elongate my wrist extensors for lateral epicondylitis. I would stretch it this way. It's all very logical, right? Extrinsic stretch, which you know how to do. Make their hand into a fist and stretch it. Do it on yourself. You'll feel how much more intense it is. Don't make a fist yourself and stretch it this way. Hold their hand into a fist and stretch it. Yeah, huh? And then this way. Not to hyperextend, but just to hold straight their fingers. And do this before and after work or before and after tasks. Right? Because sometimes we work way harder at home. My husband works in an office all day, and at home he is like the, you know, digging holes and hauling things and, you know. So before and after tasks, not just your job at work, right? But before the things that we do. One thing that research does support, which I don't really understand why it works, I've gone to a seminar on it that was a whole day, or maybe it was two days, and I don't really understand why it works. It doesn't make sense to me, but there is a, a, a treatment that was originated in, in the world of physical therapy called um, uh, mobilization with movement. Mobilization with movement. So if you look in the PT world, they want to mobilize everything and strengthen everything, right? So they mobilize the joint and then they have you move through motion and that was shown to decrease symptoms related to epicondylitis with support in the literature. I'm not going to show you because it's a two-day class. <laughs> I can't educate you how to do it. And you mobilize the joint and then you have them go through repetitions, 10 repetitions of ranging the motion, ranging the muscle that you're working on. It's, it's used primarily in PT for cervical spine to create um, cervical rotation, um, but they use it all over in the whole body, not just the upper quadrant. It's also called nags and snags. They call it the class, nags and snags. Um, so that is supported in the literature. I don't use it. I don't. But um, we had two students that did it in my level one clinic, and they had success. But that wasn't the only thing that we did. So how do you know what where we worked? Right. You have to isolate that out. Only do that. All right. So this just shows you how to stretch for epicondylitis. Right, those positions that I just showed you, right? We also want to um, look at someone's job site. You know, I was watching my daughter type last night, and she's sitting at this desk. Her chair is all the way down, and she's typing like this. I'm like, oh my god, that's terrible. But I'm like, oh, I have to deal with that now. i got to go to bed. <laughs> so, but yeah, look at how we're typing. And there's... Um, Literature out there, I think there's an ergonomic workstation in your book set up. There's stuff in Pedretti all over in there. Um, they've even changed some things where they indicate that they used to say elbows 90, but now they say different. So we stand now instead of sit. Look at the tilt of the pelvis, you know, all those things. You know, a lot of us are laptop users in the bed, which is like, I do that all the time. It's terrible for you, right? You're, horrible posture because you're all rounded and leaning against the headboard, right? And you're way down here in your lap. You're looking down. Mm -hmm. I forget. Is it good or bad to use those like wrist, like little wrist supports? The wrists typing? are to support to put your body in the right position. Mm -hmm. So if you're already in a bad position, like my daughter up here, and then you add a wrist support, it's bad. <laughs> but it depends on your state, your whole station. That's one method to get 
improved position. And, and the problem is, you know, I mean, people are all different sizes. So in your home, your roommate might, that you use the, work, the same workstation, or your spouse might be really tall, and you might be really short. So you have to have adjustable stations to really be the right one. Or you might even share a workspace in your work work. Let's just go a little bit longer, and we'll take a break, OK? Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I just want to let everyone know so that you know everyone. OK. All right. And then sometimes we have to modify other activities like sports. Like if it's a golfer's elbow, you, you can get uh, increased grip handles, right? You can change the handle of your golf club. I would recommend that someone go ahead and change all, like change one club and try it out. Make sure you like it because people that are golfers are very particular about stuff like that. Or tennis, change the handle. If you're going to rake your yard and you have those old rakes that were handed down from your grandma and grandpa, they have the wooden handles that are slippery and no rubbery, like put something on it. Wrap it with foam and then put sticky tape around it so you've got a gripper, right? Enlarge the handle, make it um, rubberized or some way. So enlarging the handle makes the, the pressure less. Stretch before and after. And then I put modalities here. If it's truly an itis, you could ice it, but that would be for very acute. If it's an osis, icing is not going to work. Ultrasound, I just throw these modalities up, and then we're going to go over them at the very end after all the diagnoses, OK? So ultrasound could be used, or iontophoresis could be used. But we're going to go over them all at the end, because you use them with all these itises, right? Operative treatment. They go in and they excise the pathological tissue. They do, so they either call it like a, a lateral epicondyle debridement or release, they might call it. Has a low success rate as compared to most operative conditions. So it's kind of a last resort. But I've had patients that have had it done and rave about how much better they feel. So um, they sometimes also might go in there and they might rough up and stimulate the bone which produces bleeding, which would stimulate healing, okay? They might have to remove some osteophytes, so if you have an arthritic elbow, there might be some bony growths that are at the joint that are irritating the muscle that they would smooth out and, and remove and for surgery. There's also, has anyone heard of platelet injections for epicondylitis? No? Um, I've only seen a few patients with this, but they take platelets from your body and then they inject them at the lateral epicondyle with the, the, it makes kind of sense thinking that it would stimulate healing to the area, but there's no evidence that supports it in the literature. And I went to a course last spring that was led by a physician and he said he felt it was unethical for any surgeons to do that at this point because it's not supporting the literature. It's not covered by Medicare anymore. It used to be when it first came out, um, but it's no longer covered by Medicare. Um, but some doctors are still doing it. But I've only seen like maybe four people ever that had it done. It kind of came out, was kind of um, knocked down and taken away, kind of. It came out and then Oh, this is going to be the greatest thing because we don't have a good choice for lateral epicondylitis because therapy doesn't work and neither does the surgery, right? But it, it really hasn't been the answer. But if you do the surgery, can it come back? Or is it most of the time when they do the surgery, is it pretty? It could come back. It depends on what you're doing. Okay. You, you have know? to change the motion. you got to change. If you, if, it, if you have the surgery and you go back to doing the exact same things mm -hmm. and the bad habits of not stretching, working too heavy lifting, not modifying your activity, would it come back? Mm -hmm. so. The surgery is just taking out that pathological tissue. Our body can always make more pathological tissue. <laughs> right? Okay. If patients do have surgery, they likely are not even sent to therapy, but they might be sent to therapy. But it's, it's something quick. Paste in a, placed in a post-op bundle for a short time. Ice to manage edema, which they would do at home. Maybe a wrist control splint initially to let them rest. We would start um, a tuba grip sleeve. Do you know what tuba grip is? It's, it's an elastic 
tubular dressing. It's kind of like putting a girdle around the extremity. Increases tissue pressure from the outside, just like with lymphedema. Banjing, but it's thin, right? Um, tuber grip sleeve increases tissue pressure to push the edema out. And, and we talk about edema a lot. Not lymphedema, but in edema where it's because of post-op or a trauma. Why do, we, why do you think we care so much about edema? Any thoughts? Like, it's going to eventually go away. Why do we care about it? Is that not like increased risk of like clots and things like that? Or? No. The more edema, the more scar tissue that gets laid down. Mm -hmm. And in our extremities, we want them to move and glide. And if we don't address the edema, the more scar. The more scar, the harder it is to get to move. So I tell my patients, you need to control the edema with everything, every diagnosis. Because the more edema you leave in your extremity, the more scarring you're going to have, which means the more stiffness you're going to have, which means the more times you're going to have to come see me at $30 a copay, right? Could be or 40 or 20 or whatever their, their insurance is, right? So the more therapy they're going to need. So it's really critical that we get on that edema and we get it under control. It's critical. One of the most important things we can do in the beginning. Um, initiation of range of motion early, gentle strengthening at four weeks, manage the scar, and then at eight weeks they can pretty much go to back to everything. That's the same medial or lateral epicondylitis. Okay? Are we good? Should we take a quick break? Let's take, let's just take till quarter after, and then we'll, we're going to cover the clear veins and um, trigger finger, which I think we're both diagnoses in case mm -hmm. so. okay. Um, okay. So now we're going to talk about a different type of itis. Okay, it's nice being able to see all the trees. Um, the green, okay? mm -hmm. All right. Um, the clear veins tenosynovitis. So you might call, might people, people might call it zephyr veins, clear veins. Either there's no, I don't know the correct way. Well, people say it all different kinds of ways. It was named after the gentleman that discovered it. So. Um, and it was a long time ago. So, um, and actually, um, I leave this in the PowerPoints. I've always, for my whole career, said do clear veins apostrophe S. But I read an article last year that said we really shouldn't do that because it's not that Declar veins has the tenus and avitis. <laughs> They're really S. Uh, there's, but I leave it there because. That's how everybody in the industry writes it, but it's really actually incorrect. But you'll see it like a Tenal's test. If you see the word Tenal's test, you know what I'm talking about, Tenal? There's lots of tests that are named after people, and we write them with the name apostrophe S. But that's really all incorrect because it's not Tenal that has the test. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, my family always have the whole Meyer thing. And when I type Meyer on my, on my well, that's phone, close. it auto corrects right. and adds an S every time, and that's not correct. <laughs> it drives me crazy. Like, is it Meyer or Meyer? That's, that's, that's a Midwestern usage. Yes, I read it's it. It's an like obviously grammatically incorrect, but it's Midwestern right. usage. Yeah. But it's in my cell phone, I, I auto corrects it to be incorrect. <laughs> But anyway, it's Midwestern. It is Midwestern. But anyway, this is incorrect. But I leave it that way to make a point to show you that it's actually incorrect. Because if I change, then I wouldn't remember it. So, okay. So remember we talked about those extrinsic extensors. Okay? And remember we talked about that retinaculum that's divided into the six compartments. And some of the compartments share the tunnel with other tendons. And the first compartment is one of them. The first dorsal compartment shares these two tendons, EPB and APL. They share a tunnel. They're, they're roommates, okay? 
And that in itself causes a problem. Okay? So these are the tendons that extend our thumb and abduct our thumb. The way that one of the pot, one of the tests that we do, again, we write incorrectly, Finkelstein's test. It's not Finkelstein's test. <laughs> it should not have an apostrophe, but we all write it. If you look in all the literature too, it does that. They write it like that. Um, anyway. Finkelstein's test is one way to check it. And this puts these muscles on a, the greatest length. So I just put my thumb down into my palm, wrap my fingers around it, and I ulnarly deviate. Okay? And we all might feel a little pulling, right? Just like if I were to bend down and oh, today I'm tight. Bend down and touch my toes, I'm gonna feel pulling, right? So Feeling, oh, that feels tight, that's not positive, right? If they go to do it and they're like, oh, oh, that really hurts, that's a positive, okay? Just tightness is not a positive. That's a Finkelstein's test. And it would be pain in this radial wrist area. I could even do a muscle manual muscle test to thumb extension to see if that creates my pain here manual muscle test thumb extension and it hurts right here, that could indicate another pot. If I'm, if I'm questioning it, like they, I do a Finkelstein's test and I'm not really sure yet, because some people tolerate pain more than others, you know? That really, really hurts and, and if I'm not really sure if it's that, I could palpate that first dorsal compartment, I could do a manual muscle test to thumb extension and if it hurts right there, that could be another indicator that it's declaring. Okay. So, how it presents is this pain with this thumb extension. It's frequently associated with new mothers or grandmothers. Because think about it. We pick up the baby, we put the baby in the bed. We put the baby out of the bed into the high chair. We put the baby onto the changing table, carry the baby in these weird positions hold the bottle for the baby, right? Lots of thumb and wrist motions that maybe you're not used to and then you, all of a sudden you start doing it or grandma comes to visit from out of town, you know, comes to stay with you, help with the baby and while she's there she makes five lasagnas, cleans out your pantry, you know, does all your laundry for you to get you caught up. Right? And she comes home and connects the doctor and she has pain in this area. Right? So, um, it might be swollen in this first dorsal compartment area, which I could test with my tape measure, do a circumferential measurement around the wrist, compare dominant or right involved to uninvolved side. Um, I wrote um, triggering of the thumb. So we'll just use, we'll just say this is our muscle that was that thumb extensor, right? And it gets inflamed. The tendon gets inflamed, and every time my muscle contracts, it slides underneath that first dorsal compartment, and it irritates it. And sometimes, if the patient moves their thumb, you can feel it, clicky clicky. You can feel it gliding underneath that retinaculum. And then that should not be a party trick. That, oh, feel this. <laughs> right? Because every time you're gliding it underneath there, it's like if you had a wound here and you kept rubbing it over and over, the darn thing's never going to heal. Right? So, you know, because what's happening is this tendon is shearing as it goes underneath this tunnel. Stenosis. Tenosynovitis. Stenosine tenus and avitis. That's what's happening as it glides underneath there. Yeah. Does clicking indicate, oh, does it always indicate uh, stenosis? So like in other parts of the body? It can. It can. Now we can have crepitation. So you, we, we hear the word crepitation, which is where our bones kind of pop or crunch or, uh, you know, or you can have popping in a joint or cracking your knuckles we talked about last night, where that would be releasing fluid from a joint space. Right? 
But if your muscle, it depends on where we're talking about. Is it a spot where a tendon is gliding underneath something? Then it would probably be a stenosing tenosynovitis type of situation. But the clicking, if you have triggering with it, that means it's a lot worse. That's a, that's a significant finding. It's worse. Okay? You're going to have decreased grip and pin strength. Is that because you're weak? Pain. Pain. So should I strengthen this muscle? Take putty and wrap it around it and pull up against it? So I was working in a clinic two years ago, and um, there was a PT that worked off-site, and he didn't want to refer the patient to the site where I was, so he saw the patient with decurving tenosynovitis. She had a long opponent's splint, which we'll talk about, and he was having her do, and he was doing iontophoresis over the area, and he was doing, having her do all kinds of strengthening activities to her wrist extensors and grip and pinch because she was weak. She's weak in grip and pinch. And she's crying, literally tears, crying in therapy. And he comes to me and he's like, I don't know why she's not getting any better. Right? Um, you're doing things that are, in my mind, contraindicated and you're charging her. Right? Look proximal. Does she have a proximal weakness issue that's causing this problem? Strengthen that. Strengthen something different, not the muscle that's stenosing, gliding underneath. Does it make any sense to you? So if you just Google, if you do a Google search, and my students in the clinic do this all the time. Like they'll get a diagnosis, like they'll know they have a new patient coming in. They'll do a Google search that night just to look to see what comes up with different ideas. All the time, strengthening things of itises. It's all over out there. Does it make any sense? <coughs> no, it doesn't in my mind. So, they're not having decreased grip and pinch strength because those muscles are atrophied. It's because it hurts. It's painful. They're inflamed, right? Um, they might also have decreased wrist and thumb motion because muscles that are inflamed don't like to lengthen, don't like to shorten, right? It's called washerwoman sprain because in the olden days women used to take laundry and scrub it against a board, right? That's what they called it, washerwoman sprain. And it's three to ten times greater in females than men. So I would like to say, and I know the men in here are outnumbered, like the women do all the work, but in reality, if you look at the size of wrists, right? I have kind of big wrists even though I'm short, but some women's wrists are very small, very small, right? And we have the same anatomy that has to go through there as a man's bigger wrist, right? So if you have a problem with stenosis, it's going to be more likely in a smaller space already than in a bigger space, right? Well, and plus it's very common with women. Women naturally are the caretakers of the children because of the whole breastfeeding thing, right? And so um, they're involved with those activities. So it is more common. I could also go, I don't know what I have is this or something else, but that um, our joints are more mobile because of our home hormones. So the and we are at risk of prearthritis. And I think you could probably do a poll of most people in um, my general age group, and we have some pain in our thumbs. Right. We're I guess from cross We're going to talk about, because I'm just hypothesizing what I think is going on with you, which is a differential diagnosis for this. But, but you bring up a good point. Women are more mobile. Like, if you think of, especially when our hormones are pumping, like during pregnancy, why do we need to be more mobile? Let the baby out. You gotta let the baby out, right? So, when people are more mobile, right then your muscles have to work harder to support the joint like we talked about that yesterday right with Sierra she has hypermobility at her elbows so her muscles have to work harder to provide stability to the joint because the ligaments are not as much so that's another reason yeah okay all right so treatment of this 
um, we want to rest it. And these are the muscles, they're extrinsic muscles, so do we need to include the wrist in the splint? Yes. 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 Um, they're extrinsic muscles, so the splint that is required is a long opponent splint, which you probably made in 4720. A thumb spica, right? But it has to cross the wrist. And it has to include the thumb. I get lots of patients that see their family doc for this get put in a wrist caca. It's not the right splint, right? You need to immobilize the wrist and the thumb. Uh, you can use ultrasound, which we're going to talk about later. Iontophoresis, activity modification. Just like with epicondylitis, figure out ways to avoid this wrist and thumb motion. One question, with the splint, do you think we should immobilize the thumb in radial abduction or palmar abduction? Radial. Why do you say radial? Well, that's more of a natural. This is a natural. Can I write if I put my thumb out here radially? You said the palm over here said the Why do you think palmar? Uh, yeah, and I guess it's more like a neutral position, mm -hmm. like the rest of the thing. Yeah. Because you're trying to not stress that. It's, it's another problem. It's a debate. Okay? So there is no right or wrong answer. Okay? If muscles are irritated, we want to put them on a slab. Knowing that these are thumb extensors and abductors, it would be better for the muscle if we put it in radial abduction because it puts the muscle on a slack, right? But if I put my thumb in radial abduction, then I can't do any functional tasks with my hand, right? So then I'm either fighting against the splint or I take it off and do what I need to do. If I put my thumb in radial abduction, I can no longer write because I have to have opposition to be able to write. So it's really, there's no good answer. If someone already had like a prefab splint that was a long opponent splint that they paid for themselves at Walgreens or whatever, and they had a referral to come to me and splinting was included, I could make them a hard thermoplastic splint that held them in radial abduction for nighttime use and then have them use the one for Palmer during the day. I could do that. And it would depend, like, are they triggering? It's more severe. It's more, has it been longer term, more severe, right? Otherwise, they might get better with activity modification, a couple of modalities, and putting them in pulmonary abduction. But you with know? full compliance, radial abduction is going Radial to abduction, you always want to put a muscle on a slab. So even like the wrist cock up splint for epicondylitis, if it's lateral epicondylitis, you want to put the wrist in slight extension to put the muscle on a slack. Because muscles that are itis don't like to lengthen. If you put them on a slack, it lets them calm down quicker. Medial epicondylitis, we don't really want to put people in flexion because we have this nerve that goes through there that we can compress. So neutral. Lateral epicondylitis, a little bit of extension. So ideally would be radial abducted but not always feasible for function. And if someone's pushing against the splint to use their thumb, it's, you're going to be creating more problems than not wearing the splint at all, right? So, okay. And I put um, also soft tissue mobilization because you want to you want to work the whole muscle. Don't just focus on here because there might also be problems like fibrosis in the muscle belly that we have to attend to right, and stretching it. We want to increase range of motion, but I don't want them to do all of these exercises, right, because that's just creating that sliding underneath that retinaculum, right? But I might want them to lengthen it and then relax. Lengthen it and then relax, right? Okay. Okay. Surgery for that would be to um, cut the dorsal retinaculum to take the pressure or the stenosine off the tendon. So you saw the picture when we covered anatomy of that dorsal retinaculum. They just cut it the full length. 
this way. Okay? Um, it's, a, it's a quick, easy surgery. You're only immobilized, again, for a short time, and you start range of motion, scar management, edema management for the same reasons we discussed. Strengthening, the book says two to four weeks. I wait four. And um, these patients sometimes don't even come to therapy. They'll be fine just on their own. But sometimes they will if they're having trouble. And then I mentioned this uh, radial sensory nerve, the dorsal radial sensory nerve again, because that nerve goes through here and frequently gets irritated with the surgical. Okay. So, I can't remember your first name, sorry. Jeannie. Jeannie. I knew it would be with a J, but I was like, is it Jamie or is it Jeannie? <laughs> Jeannie talked about her thumb hurting, right? What kinds of things do we think could be a differential diagnosis for Jacobian's tenosynovitis? and bite? What else is in this area that's a diagnosis that we could, even though we haven't covered everything yet, you must be able to think of something. Right? Not to point out, but I don't know how old Jeannie is. 52. So. I would not guess that, Jeannie. <laughs> that's kind of like in the middle age. Very impressive. You know, middle age. What happens to our bone structure as we age? Or what are we more likely to develop? Osteoporosis, but arthritis, right? So it could be CMC osteoarthritis, right? Remember when we did all of our fingers um, to our palm and they all go to what bone? <laughs> to the scaphoid. Do you remember when we look on the dorsal side of our hand, what's under our snuff box from anatomy and physiology? Scaphoid. What did you say? <laughs> the scaphoid. So it could be a scaphoid fracture. Again, we're gonna we're gonna take our history. Was there a fall, right? Or did they visit? Did grandma visit? Um, you know, was there a fall in the outstretched hand, or was grandma visit, visiting daughter with a new baby? Like those things are gonna help lead you into what the heck's going on, right? And palpation. And we're gonna learn about other tests to rule out other things, but could be those things. Okay, we're gonna talk about something else that is another differential diagnosis to declare veins tenosynovitis. And if you look at the notes in your PowerPoint, I left it in there just because I thought it was funny. I don't know why I wrote this in there, but um, you know how when you talk about some things are the horse and some things are the zebra? Well, I don't know why I wrote giraffe in the book. <laughs> so I just think it's funny because one time I wrote giraffe, and they're like, what's a giraffe? I'm like, giraffe? But I wrote it in the notes in the PowerPoint. But intersection syndrome is one of the zebras, okay? De Quir or the giraffe. De Quir veins would be the horse. In West Michigan, we see horses all over the place, not so many zebras, right? So intersection syndrome. Does that make sense? Not as common. Oh, the English, sorry. Yeah, like if you're only going to see a zebra when you go to the zoo, right? But you're going to see horses all over the place, right? So this, again, is a compartment problem, but now we're taking into account our wrist extensors, okay? So it involves two compartments. The first compartment that we just talked about with De Quir veins, and adding on the second compartment, which involves our, remember E would be extensors, C is always carpi, wrist, right? And um, so our wrist extensors on the radial side, second, they share the tunnel, they're roommates in the second compartment. And it's where these tendons cross over one another. So I have a picture that shows that retinacular, let me get it, it's the same picture from the anatomy presentation, right? And we see our muscles come up here, and then we see our wrist extensors 
And if we follow the picture all the way up, we would see that they intersect up there. Okay? So when I'm using my wrist and I'm using my thumb a lot, those muscles are rubbing over top of each other and creating an itis, an intersection syndrome. It's where the wrist extensors and those thumb muscles intersect. Okay? That's what happens with intersection syndrome. So if I go back to this, um, the main difference is the pain is more proximal. When you have de Quer veins, the pain is right typically at the compartment. When you have um, intersection syndrome, it's about four to six centimeters proximal. And I put Lister's tubercle here only because I kind of want to bring it up because we're going to talk about it later on. Here I am drawing the radius again. Here's the radius, okay? You have this little bony prominence on the end of the radius. And it's important because tendons go across it. We'll talk about it later. So it's right here. You can palpate a bony. If you palpate your radius, not on the side, on the top. Can you feel it? It's a little bony prominence. That's Lister's tubercle. Everyone got it? So this pain is proximal four to six centimeters to Lister's tubercle. It's very common with rowers, because think of what they do, right? And weightlifters. So again, when you get the story between behind your patients and what happened and what do you, what do you do, you know, what are your hobbies, what do you work, that kind of stuff, you'll start to this will start to lead you in this whole investigation process, right? And they also might have this crepitation or clicking or popping that you might feel, but it's going to be more up here with wrist and thumb motion. Okay. All right, so that's the um, giraffe or zebra. And treatment is very similar to de Quer veins. Splinting, long opponent splint, because it involves those extrinsic extensors. We need to include the wrist and the thumb. Um, same modality as before, activity modification, same types of things. And then post-op, splinting again, gentle range of motion, strengthening a little bit later, four to six weeks. And we always manage edema. You'll see that, you'll see manage edema and scar on everything. Because we always have to do that. And why do we manage edema? Prevent scars, right? Okay, next diagnosis, we're doing good on time. Um, trigger finger. Trigger finger was another diagnosis that we saw in, um, I'm like afraid to, I couldn't write in there, but I'm like afraid to, if it won't, should I try a little piece and see yeah. right it I think yeah. you should. I do. Yeah. It's hard to see here. Alright, can you see better here? Right? 
Okay. Oh, sorry. VIP. Um, and this, these pulleys aren't drawn to scale. They're in your book in the, or in your book or in the presentation on anatomy because you have five pulleys, right? You're not drawing them all. The, the problem with trigger finger is at this pulley, which is the A1 pulley. Same thing. You have the fishing rod, right? The purpose of the pulleys is just like in the fishing pole, hold the string next to the pole. These pulleys are holding the tendon next to the bone. Okay? So these are all hooked to muscle belly, our extrinsic flexors, and attach where? No, these are flexors, so they attach to the medial epicondyle on the molar surface. Flexor group. FDP and FDS. Can't write and talk at the same time. FDS, FDP. Okay? Profundus goes all the way to the end. Superficialis, right? A1 pulley. Muscle contracts, pulls on the string, and the finger goes down, right? Muscle relaxes, lets the string go, goes back up. So the, pull, the tendon glides back and forth as the finger moves up and down, right? So what happens with trigger finger, same thing like to veins, the tendon gets irritated, right? I make a fist, pulls underneath the pulley, okay? Keeps irritating it the more I pull it under that pulley. It's already a tight space. Which tendon is irritated? Is it both? I couldn't tell which one. Yet. Which do you think would be more likely to be irritated at this point? Superficialis. It's more superficial down there, right? It's more close to where I'm going under. They both can be irritated, <laughs> but the superficialis will probably get irritated first because it's superficial, right? Um, so every time I pull that finger down, it slides that inflamed tendon under that pulley. Then the pulley gets mad, and it gets inflamed, right? Now my space is even tighter. Or I can just press on the pulley, and it hurts. I had that too. Yeah, I had that too. <laughs> um, and so sometimes, because we grip our hands when we sleep, it pushes that that nodule underneath the pulley, and then I wake up, and it won't come back up, and i got to use my other finger to click it back open. That's why it's called a trigger finger. It might even click or trigger when you go to make a fist as this inflamed tendon plops through that inflamed pulley. And you would palpate it just touching Palpating the molar MP is where your A1 pulley is. And you have one at each finger. Because we have the pulleys for each finger. So you would just palpate there. And you can feel it. You can palpate there. So I can palpate it and have my, my patient just wiggle, wiggle, wiggle like that. And you can feel that nodule going back and forth underneath that pulley if they have a the trigger. Or you might just go to touch it, and they're like, ow, oh, that, that really hurts right now. <laughs> Very common. More common as we age, because we have less circulation, and we don't recover and heal from things. OK? Um, I think there's a genetic component, because people that get trigger fingers in one finger are very likely to get trigger fingers in other fingers. So I, the most I've had with one patient are nine. Mm. I had one patient that had nine trigger finger surgical releases over time. Is this really painful from like the good stuff and you have to put it up? Very painful. Very painful. <laughs> surgery was definitely the best option. So I didn't have surgery for mine. I could I finally when I could not. Like, I would spend time massaging. Working it out. And then eventually it would flip, and I would be on with my life. Then one day when I couldn't do it any longer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interestingly, I had it in my other hand, and it went away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So presentation, this pathological thickening of the sheath of the flexor tendon, FDP, FDS. Um, most commonly affecting the FDS, we know why, because it's superficial, right? And the A1 pulley. You can trigger at other pulleys, but A1 is the horse and anywhere else is the zebra, okay? It's usually always the A1 pulley. It's because of the amount of force that it gets at that area with forceful gripping. You can maybe, you might feel a popping or a clicking. You can palpate a nodule at A1, like I said, feel here and have them wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Um, it might lock where they require passive extension of the digit to get it to straighten, which is very painful. So when I got mine, I was young, my kids were, but my, here was my problem, I moved, so hauling boxes. I had twins with, in, using sippy cups. So you know, you tighten the sippy cup, and then it leaks and you tighten it more, then you have to untighten the sippy cup, tighten the sippy cup, constant with two, I have twins, sippy cups. And I stupidly decided to save money by buying unfinished furniture and finishing it myself all at the same time, and I developed bilateral ring finger trigger fingers. So, so I could feel it right away when it started, because I knew what it was, right? So I made myself a splint, okay? So the first, the typical splints that were, are, have always been recommended, I'm not a very good drawer, It's kind of a big thumb, okay? <laughs> so the splint, say it was my middle finger, it would come down, go around, and this would loop around the back of the hand, come out around here. I should have made the splint another color. Can you see it? So, so these two pieces wrap around the dorsum, and it just blocks that MP joint from bending all the way down. <laughs> So I, when I got my trigger fingers, I made this splint for myself, and I wore it at night when I slept. Because when we sleep, we grip our hands, right? And what I found myself doing some a little bit, you know, type A, like I talked about. I don't have a bite guard, but I probably should. Um, I would just hook around that splint. <laughs> and I would wake up and my finger would be more painful because I was just hooking around that splint. So I stopped using this splint and I made myself just a digit gutter splint yeah. for night. And then there's another splint that I found very useful for day, which looks like a T. And this part comes around here and this wraps around the proximal phalanx, like a, when you slide it on like a ring. So that was very functional for day, so I could do a lot of activities with it on, but it wouldn't allow a full fist to create enough glide for my um, tendon to go through the pulley. So I did this by day, and then a, I, couldn't, I tried this by night, didn't work for me, then full digit splint. So now, ever since I got trigger fingers, and that was like 13 years ago, I no longer make this splint for my patients. If the doctor really wanted me to, I would, but I use a digit gutter splint, just from my own experience. Um, uh, let's see, so splinting the MP to keep it from, from um, flexing, modify activity, right? ultrasound, iontophoresis, which are everything, and then differential gliding exercises, okay? Differential gliding exercises are tendons that FDP, those are such messy drawings, FDP and FDS are enclosed in a sheath up the finger, like a tube, okay? And inside there is synovial fluid, which has healing properties, okay? So, um, I don't know if we talked about yesterday, but in our forearm, our FDP shares a muscle belly. So you can't fully flex your fingers without all the fingers bending together because they have, they share a common muscle belly, okay? 
The FDS does not. But we can differentiate, sometimes with some things, and we'll talk about it this whole semester, about differential gliding. Sometimes you want those tendons to move independent of one another for different reasons, and this is one of them. So with this one, if I, say it's my ring finger that's the trigger finger, if I block the FDP of all the other fingers and I just bend my ring finger, I can only use FDS. My FDP cannot work because I'm blocking it because they share a common muscle belly. That allows my FD, and I'm not like, woo, 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 like, like that. I'm just doing gentle gliding of the FDS in the healing fluid. Differential gliding. It's just a gentle gliding exercise. So you're not going to want to do it 10 times every hour, right? couple times a day, two to three times a day, just to glide the flu the tendon, the irritated tendon in the healing fluid. And it's not going to create likely enough motion in the tendon to create a trigger, to lock it. If it locks it, then don't do it. Anything that locks it, we don't want to do it. Okay? All right, any questions about how we treat conservative. This would be a conservative trigger finger. Another option that out of our scope, the doctor might do a cortisone injection to the area, right? So when I had my bilateral trigger fingers, my right was worse than my left, even though I'm left-handed. Um, I got my right injected, which I felt like was the worst thing that I did. I felt like it irritated it worse. I couldn't do anything then after I got it injected. But anyway, through patience, activity modification, splinting, I didn't even do any modalities over it. Mine went away. But mine was very activity specific. You ever have people get like, not like necessarily addicted to those cortisone injections, but like this like when they feel pain again, they like go back to the doctor. Like one. But the doctor will only do a couple right. cortisone injections. Right. Okay. And if you see people with repeated cortisone injections, they can break down tissue. They can cause tendons to rupture. Mm -hmm. They can uh, break down fatty. They reduce fatty, which I guess then you want them all over your body. But they, they break down mm -hmm. fatty deposits as well, the cortisone. So it's not a good thing to have multiple right. cortisone. Does it also cause like blood sugar regulation? Issues? It can cause blood sugar regulation problems, all kinds of things. Like, you know, and even oral steroid use has been linked to early on, on, uh, increasing onset of um, osteoarthritis. So, like all those, I'm like anti-medicine in general <laughs> for my life. So I'm skewed, but I don't like any of that stuff. But so, like my father has occipital. Uh, what's the word? Of there's an agus there, but it, uh -huh. it's manifesting itself from a nerve that's going from the occipital region, uh -huh. shooting over here to the eye. Uh -huh. And we had talked about a nerve block instead of the cortisone injections. Right. Do you see, and I know that with the way the nerves travel, uh -huh. you might not see many nerve blocks right. in your but it's, so Most of the nerves in the upper quadrant are motor and sensory. So you don't want to do a nerve block because you need the motor, right? So, and this is a, not a nerve, this is a tendon. But yeah, you're doing nerve block because of the pain, and you're just going to keep one. Right. Mm -hmm. oh. Stenosing it. Yeah, and this is another stenosing, like the dequermings. And it feels like a thickening, like in the beginning, it feels thicker there. And you really have to know what this is because this is so common and it accompanies so many other types of problems. So you may see someone that has a, a proximal phalanx fracture, P1 fracture, right? And they're working like so hard to get their range of motion back, and they create a trigger finger in themselves. Or you might see someone after a distal radius fracture, or those kind of things, or in a nursing home or home care that has a trigger finger. And if you catch it early enough, you can really just treat it with splinting, and that's completely within our scope. So getting a cortisone injection is going to be much, the literature shows, I can't remember the exact times how much better it is, but it's supposed to be so much more effective than taking oral by mouth. But, um, and we'll talk about antifreeze in a minute, but um, the splint, you know, 
Splinting is great. What's that splinting? I'm sorry, I got a little confused. That was for trigger finger as well, right? Trigger finger, okay. yeah. This is a T, it's a bad drawing, but these wrap around the, the proximal failings and this comes down below the MP to block MP flexion. And um, this is just to block also MP flexion. Okay, and then surgically they go in and they just cut the pulley. Because remember, A1 is not one of those necessary tent pulleys. It's A2 and A4, right? So a lot of times these patients don't need therapy. You didn't need therapy after your surgery. Sometimes they do, and mostly the reason why they do is they had increased edema, which wasn't managed properly, and they get big scar development, and they can't straighten their finger after all the way. That's like the most common reasons I see people need to come to therapy after trigger finger release. Um, these patients, you're not going to do a bunch of strengthening because I already told you they're likely to get another trigger finger and the worst thing you want to do is give them a bunch of putty exercises to get their strength back, give them another trigger finger, then they have to go back and have another surgery, right? So I would never, ever, ever give these patients putty exercises because you're going to create another trigger finger. And you have to check for it. If people complain of pain in this area, or they feel a clicking or a popping, the first thing you should think of is trigger finger. Because the worst thing you want to do is do strengthening activities. The reason why they're not strong is not because they're weak, is they're stenosed, right? Pain, inflammation. Okay, all right. So we're just going to talk about then these other treatment things that I kept mentioning that we would do, right? Um, edema management, there's lots of ways that we manage edema. Very important to manage edema because the more edema, the more scar, the more scar, the more stiffness, the more stiffness, the more therapy. Um, tuba grip sleeve is one, like we talked about. Silicone sleeve are those um, digits that have silicone on the inside, I have pictures. Coban wrap you've seen before, or isotoner glove. I don't have a picture of a glove, but everyone knows what an isotoner glove is. Isotoner gloves are, are turned inside out, cut the fingertips off, and use it for edema management for diffuse hand edema. It's great for <coughs> stroke patients with swollen hands, right, or any kind of um, hand injuries. I just read an article that. Um, Following distal radius fractures, there was a surgeon that when he would operate on the distal radius fracture, he would put an isotoner glove under the cast and had huge improvements in outcomes versus those that he didn't put the isotoner glove in, all because he's controlling edema. Same surgeon, right? Same diagnosis. He controlled the edema. So edema glove, this is the tuba grip sleeve. This is expensive. These are like $50 a box, it's outrageous. So you just cut off what you need. You can wash it by hand and reuse it. Cut a little hole, it's a little hash in the end for the thumb to go through. Um, this is called Coflex, which is the cheaper version of Coban. If you want to get a cheaper version, go to Tractor Supply or Family Farm and Home and get Vet Wrap, which we use to wrap horse's legs. It, that's where it originated. So you can get a $2 little roll of Coban at um, Meyer, or you can get a big roll of vet wrap and cut it the lengthwise. Don't cut it this way because that's not where it's elastic, right? Cut it the lengthwise and you'll get a big roll of it for a dollar seven. <laughs> and you can get it in camo or any color you want, right? Yeah. The tube grip, is that like elastic stocking that? It's, stockinette doesn't have any really elastic properties. This has more. I don't remember the, elast, the exact millimeters of HG of this, but it's more pressure than a stockinette. A stockinette would be like a sock, no pressure. Um, and then these are those silicone sleeves, and inside it is silicone, and that, that's just to give pressure for edema because it's pretty firm. So it's one way. And then if you have a scar in the finger, you're killing two birds with one stone. You're addressing the scar and the edema at the same time with one product. Um, these are Silopad, which is an expensive 
company that you can buy stuff through um, through Patterson Medical or North Coast. This is another company by Gel Smart and Pedifix. And these are like a fraction of the cost for silicone products versus um, Patterson Medical or North Coast. And I've had just as good of results with these. So this little square would be like $3 here. It would be like $20 in the silicone post or silicone pad. Okay? Same thing with those little um, sleeves. You can get like a five pack for, I don't know, $15 versus a five pack for $50 versus the other company. Um, the Silipad versus this company. So Silipulse, sorry Silipulse company. I used you for years, but I found a more economical option for my patients. Um, another option, so those are all edema management products. Okay, for SCAR, we also want to manage SCAR, and we use silicone products for SCAR. Anyone know why we use silicone products for SCAR? Isn't it like sterile? I guess they use. No? <coughs> they're, they're all, there's even over-the-counter type products you can buy at Meijer and Walgreens and stuff now. But silicone, there's research that supports that even just silicone oil improves SCAR properties. Okay? And then you put it in this product and it's 100% occlusive or almost 100% occlusive. Does not allow oxygen to get through to the scar to allow the scar to grow. And they really, really work good. I mean, extremely well. I highly recommend them from my experience. They work fantastic. And we care about scar because we need skin to lengthen for range of motion. And if it can't, we'll, we'll, it'll keep us from moving. Another option is this 50-50 elastomer or 50-50 putty, which I have a picture here. This is similar to like when you go to the dentist and they make molds of your teeth. For those of you that have braces or dental work done. Um, one's a catalyst and you um, mix it with the other side and then you mix it together and it becomes firm and hard. Okay, just like the molds for your teeth. They're great for shaping digit tips for scar. They're great for going in between web spaces. So if you have a scar that goes in between a web, you sometimes can't AV duct because the scar limits it, contracts it. Great for in there. It's expensive. Like these are two little things, a couple ounces each, it's $50. So you're not going to use it on a big burn patient, right? You can use it on small scars that are raised and hard. Sometimes I'll use, if I have a big raised hard scar, I might use this first and then switch the silicone. And then this just shows the silicone products um, to yours. Are we doing okay? Let's just go through the modalities and then we'll be done with this talk, okay? And we'll take a break and figure out if we want to take an early lunch or what we want to do, okay? Any questions about everything so far? Yeah. I didn't think the one at the top, the new gel, the new gel, is that just the same thing? Another brand. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just mm -hmm. checking. There's lots of brands out there. You differ, every company has its own name. Do they all expire? Because I'm going to an expiration. Yeah. Everything expires. Even, even Theraband expires. And everything expires. Yeah. Uh, 50 50 putty. Or 50 50 elastomer. Okay? So now we're going to talk about ultrasound. And you did not learn enough within our curriculum to be able to do ultrasound by yourself. Right? You have one lecture on modalities, or maybe two, right? And so um, you have to go to additional testing or additional courses so that you can learn how to effectively. Now, I'm not saying this when you can't put a hot pack or use ice. Like, those are easier. Or even fluidotherapy, like those types. But sound and electric modalities, you need additional training. Okay? Um, so there's two reasons why we do ultrasound. And 
And ultrasound is another thing that's poorly researched and it doesn't show in any way that it works. <laughs> that's why if we were to do ultrasound on a patient and if it was covered by an insurance company, we would get like $6 because it's not proven to be effective even though I have seen so much benefit from it. I even had personal experience. I was at a fundraiser with my husband golfing, which I don't golf. And you know when you're at some of those fundraisers, everyone gets backed up because you have all these non-golfers golfing and everyone's it's just a big crowded mess. So I had moved ahead to the women's tee and they had a big shed there. So I stood on the other side of the shed so that when the boys went, the women could go and we could move on and get out of the way. You know? So my husband's back there, he hits the ball, it must have had some homing device on it because it was like this far from the ground and it went and then it turned and it went directly at me and hit me in the calf and knocked me down. Oh my God. It was terrible, I couldn't walk, like it knocked me down. He runs up and then as soon as he saw I was still alive, he's like dying laughing, did you see that? I can't believe that happened. But, um, <laughs> My calf hurt so bad. And this was a Saturday, okay? I could hardly walk on it. And so I had a cart, thank God. I didn't golf anymore. I just rode in the cart. And um, my calf was just killing me. And then Monday morning, the first thing I did was I went to work and I sounded my calf. And so from personal experience, huge difference. There's no, there's no research to support it. And I actually went to a talk that was given by a physical therapist and she says that their accreditation requires that they teach ultrasound within their curriculum but she tells her students it doesn't work and don't use it because there's no research to support it. So that, that is true. So when you learned about modalities, and I don't have this memorized in my head, but how deep do you think a hot pack goes? Not very deep, right? So hot packs are not used a lot in PT to gain motion, more for just comfort and to help muscles maybe relax, right? Because they don't go deep enough to really impact a thermal change on the muscle tissue because they're working on deep muscles, right? But in the hand, everything's really superficial. There's not much depth to a finger. Right? So if I wrap heat around it, I can really impact the, impact the elasticity of the finger to allow it to move more. What about sound? How deep do you think it goes? Hmm? Deeper than a hot pack, but still not deep. Not that deep. So if you're working on a big hip joint, that sound is not going to go deep enough or even to a shoulder it's not going to go deep enough to affect change. Do you think many OTs are doing research on ultrasound? No. It's not occupational based activity. Right? So there's no, and then the research that is done on it is stupid. Like, they do, I just read an article on carpal tunnel. They did ultrasound over carpal tunnel. Well, that's an anatomical problem. Why would that? make a change you know we we need to do smarter research on things that make more sense instead of doing this research that of course is going to not work because it doesn't go deep enough to the tissue or you know a physiatrist just, doing that research or osteo it would be pts i think we've done most of the research but they're working on big joints where it's not going to go deep enough to impact change um so anyway, she teaches this to her PT students, which is really disheartening because I've seen huge benefit. Another big problem is that people don't go to the training to properly use it. You, you finish school, you go to level two, you're trained with your CI, and you just do whatever they taught you to do. Right? You have to go to the evidence, look at the literature, and find out what's been shown to be to work or to increase tissue temperature. So the two reasons we do ultrasound would be a ther we're always creating heat, but heat enough to be considered thermal or non-thermal. Okay? So if I see you on level two and I go up to you and you're doing an ultrasound, I'm like, are you doing thermal or non-thermal? 
You should know, or you shouldn't be doing it, right? You should know the answer. Am I doing thermal or non-thermal? What did you learn about, what do you know about ultrasound from your talk? I know it was like a year ago, right? Do you remember anything about ultrasound? <laughs> It's okay if you don't. Anything? You can't hold it in one spot. You can't hold it in one spot for a long time. It's kind of like a candle, right? If you had a candle and you took your finger and you and you went, okay, first you went really fast over it. Would you create a lot of heat? No. Then you went slower, a little bit of heat, right? Then really slow, more heat. Stop and hold it, burn. Right? So you can burn your patients with ultrasound if you're not careful. What else do you remember about ultrasound? Use a gel. You use a gel to help. It's a conducting agent, really. That otherwise the sound will bounce off your skin back into the crystal within the sound head and fry up your machine. So you have to use the gel to help the sound go through. There's contraindications, like if there's cancer. There's contraindications. You won't want to do sound over cancer or a tumor because it will increase circulation and make the tumor grow. Anything else you can remember <laughs> about sound? Okay. All right, so let's talk about sound. So there's different reasons why we would do it. These non-thermal reasons, where we're just trying to increase metabolic rate or increase circulation. Yeah. You said this is non-thermal? We're talking about both. So increasing metabolic rate and decreasing pain, and we can see how much we want to increase the temperature, one Celsius or two to three Celsius. Those are non-thermal. Those are considered non-thermal. If I want to increase collagen tissue extensibility, I want to impact scar, I want to impact joint. I need to increase the temperature to 4 Celsius. Now this is an article from the Advanced Magazine, which is not a peer-reviewed, you know, journal. But it's hard to find information that shows us exactly how much temperature will increase with each minute, depending on how I put the parameters of the ultrasound. Right? I need to sit down and do a, a, a lip search and see what I can find out there to see if I can find something more, more um, peer reviewed. But in general, using this um, <clears throat> template, if I did, so there's things that we can change on the ultrasound on the machine, right? We can use different heads which create different depths. The one megahertz goes deeper than the three megahertz. <coughs> and then I can change how many, how many minutes I do it for, and I can change the intensity. Okay? How, does anyone know how long you have to do something to, be, to bill it to Medicare? 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. Seven, seven, eight. Seven. Eight. Oh, eight minutes. All So, if we want to bill Medicare for ultrasound, we want to do it eight minutes. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can use this formula to figure out how high you want to make the intensity to get to your desired tissue temperature change if you want to do it eight minutes to bill for it. But I already told you, you're only going to get six bucks. And if you're going to do it eight minutes, that means you're being reimbursed less than a dollar a minute for doing an ultrasound. Right? So does doing ultrasounds make money for the clinic? No, it doesn't. Um, so if I want to, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm doing 3 megahertz, I'm going to increase my tissue temperature 0.6 at 1.0 for every minute. Okay? So if I, if I want to increase it to at least 4, I want to do it seven to eight minutes to get, get that tissue temperature up. Are you seeing how I'm figuring that out? Because this will tell you, depending on which head you're using, how much you're increasing the tissue temperature at each intensity per minute. You just do the math to figure it out. 
So you can't just do the same thing for everybody because it won't work. What am I trying to accomplish? Does my patient have pain? Am I doing it for pain? Am I doing it because they're, they're, they had a distal radius fracture, now their wrist won't move, so I'm going to sound it and stretch it? Different levels of temperature change. If you don't change it high enough, if you don't have a high enough temperature, you're not going to impact tissue extensibility. Does anyone know how long the, the effects of ultrasound last after you're done? Someone says 20 minutes. Any other thoughts? Yes, right? Did you learn that in your modalities? Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. The effects of the ultrasound last five minutes. You're not really selling this. I'm okay. not selling it. If I'm wearing Medicare, I will be denied this. Right. That's what I think you said. How long do your leg felt better? Five hours? No. It felt better instantly for a long time. But here's but I changed the inflammation. I changed what happened for circulation for that five minutes. Did it move out inflammatory tissue during that five minutes, which then made me feel better for a prolonged period of time? I'm talking about the tissue temperature change. That's why. The change in tissue temperature lasts five minutes. Not, not the, well, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If I'm trying to increase tissue extensibility, okay, I sound the area, I just finish, turn off the machine, and someone says, Nancy, uh, one of your patients called, they're on line two, can you get the phone? Do I take the call? No. Do I go to the bathroom? No. I got five minutes to stretch this tissue. I might stretch during the sound. If I stretch during the sound, do I go for the sound and the stretch? Both? No. Unethical. Which one do you think it would be smarter for the clinic to go for? Stretch. The stretch. <laughs> right? Um, I have seen huge change. I would love to do a research project on this, is, is looking at distal radius fractures, because a lot of times, if I can't get the wrist to flex because it's scarred, I'll sound while I stretch, and I feel a huge change. In fact, I, um, I had a patient in the, in the level one clinic, and they, she was being treated by the students, and she was treated, she had significant wrist stiffness following the surgery. The students saw her for three weeks for therapy, and they did not do sound with her. When I picked her up, I think she had, well, I mean, I was, I was supervising her, and she had other things, so it, it was like, how much can you fit into a session? Um, so when the students stopped seeing her, her other things were improving, but her wrist was not improving. They were stretching in every visit. This would be like a single case study, right? I then sounded her and stretched. In one visit, she gained 20 degrees. So I see that it makes a difference. But I would have to do a research study. And then my ethical things, do I withhold the other things to truly show that the sound made a change? You know, there's all these things, right, that make it so hard to show. But from my experience, I see that thermal ultrasound makes a difference. When I got my calf smacked with the golf ball, I did one sound and it made a significant difference. With bruising, how I could walk, felt the pain was less, I did one. That would be a non-thermal and a thermal example, you know. But the thing is, is sound is, is everyone aware, we you taught this, has this been truly researched? Is there something more current out there that shows that this is how much we need to increase the tissue temperature to make its tissue extensibility? If you didn't learn all of this, is everybody else learning about tissue extensibility? What else could impact sound? What about if there's a plate in there? Which will absorb more sound, metal or fat? Metal, right? What if I'm doing um, sound over a forearm and I have someone who's obese versus I have someone who's extremely thin. Would I need to change my parameters? Yes. 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 Because at a 
adipose tissue is going to absorb more sound without changing the tissue temperature. Which one did you say was deeper, the one with the head the tree? One. If I'm doing it over a finger, is there a lot of muscle in there? No. Is there a lot of bone and tendon? Bone and tendon will absorb sound quicker than fat or muscle. Throw a metal plate in there, right? So you have to know what you're doing, where you're applying it to, the specific patient that you're working with, what their tissue is like, to make decisions that are educated. You don't just use the same level for every patient. You don't just do what your CI taught you because you have to use for every patient, you should be making individual clinical decisions. And part of it is how fast I move it. You shouldn't do an area larger than twice the size of the sound head. If you do too big of an area, you'll be less effective. Was that control in the research study? If you lift the, 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 the head to scoop the gel, if it's sliding off the body, you lose conduction. You're not effective. See how many factors there are that could, would be hard to control in a research study? Did they do too big of a size? Did they lift the head? In the, the old clinic I used to work at, I had two ultrasound units. And one would beep if you didn't have enough contact with the skin. And whenever I had students, that's the one they're using. I'll wait for it, right? Because if they lifted the head off the skin to scoop gel, it would beep. And I would know it. And they would know it. It's feedback, right? So if I do have a finger and my head is larger and the side is coming, the ultrasound head is coming off the sides, my sound is going out the sides and I'm not being effective. Put two fingers together. You need 100% skin contact with the sound head. See, so. I think ultrasound works. It's not proven in the literature. But there's all of these factors that impede good research on the use of sound. So, so look, at the, look at the research. Go to a class. There's, there's a lot of gel in the hand, but there's the ultrasound machine. All right, let's talk about, we only have five minutes. Um, we only have two slides left. Okay, iontophoresis, um, that's where we use electric current to drive medication through the skin. So there's lots of meds that we use in patches, right? We take a nicotine patch, there's pain patches where we absorb medicine through our skin because our skin is porous, right? So we can absorb medicine. So with this, we use electric current to drive the medicine under the skin. This modality is not covered by Medicare. So you cannot use it with Medicare patients. You will not be reimbursed. You have to put the medicine on a patch, okay? How much do you think these patches are by? Guess how much one patch costs. For us to buy as a therapist. Fifteen? Okay, if it was a hundred, no one would ever do it. Right? Twelve dollars about. Depending on the size. But how much do you think we get reimbursed for anatophoresis? Six. Nothing? Nothing. Well, Medicare nothing. No. Medicare nothing. Um, for Ianto, I don't know. Eighteen dollars. So you might cover the cost of the patch, right? So you see what I'm saying? It's not a profitable thing. So again, are therapists even motivated to do research on these things that we don't even get paid for? Right? There's like all these issues, right? So it's not a money maker, but again, I think it's a useful modality. We use, it, it works on the theory the, for electric current. Opposites attract and the same repel, like Paula Abdul, opposites attract, right? <laughs> so you take a medicine, you have to know the polarity of the medicine to know whether you put the positive or the negative 
the little jumper cable thing over the medicine. So you have to know the polarity of your medicine. Commonly for itises, you would use dexamethasone, which is an anti-inflammatory, it's a steroid, okay? It has a negative polarity. All of the medicines that I use with iontophoresis have a negative polarity. So when I have students, I always tell them, put the black on the boo-boo. And then you remember, because the black is the negative, you're going to put the black has a negative medicine, opposites attract the same repels, right? You put the negative charge over the negatively um, negative medicine and the same repels and that pushes the medicine through the skin. That's how it works, okay? Other medicines that we use um, are for scar. So I have seen huge success with taking medicines, putting it on the patch, putting it over scar, and reducing scar inside the hand that's limiting structures from gliding. Those would be saline solution, but you can't just use saline from Walgreens. It's not the correct um, concentration of saline. And I've seen therapists use it. It's unethical. It doesn't work. I think the saline, I don't even know. It's like 0 0.03 or 0 0.07 for you have to go home and look, get your saline solution out or your eye drops or whatever and see what the concentration is. It's very low. It has to be, and, and don't quote me on all this because I don't use this as much now that I teach, but 4.0, I believe, is the correct concentration of saline. So you have to have it made at a compound pharmacy for it to be effective. Another medicine is potassium iodide, which again has to be made at a compound pharmacy. And it used to be the correct concentration they recommended was 7, and now I believe it's increased to 10. So you have to know that. And if, you're, if you want literature on that, call this company Epi. EMPI, they sell these patches and they want you to buy them. So ask them for them to give you some literature, which again, they're going to find literature that supports the use of the product, but at least it's going to give you information on the correct um, parameters of the medicines that you use. Um, so the opposite track, same repel, negative medicine, pushes the medicine under the skin. And there's different, this is called a foreser. And this is one company that I like, Empty, and I like these Empty patches because they, they're good for small body parts. Some of the other companies that are cheaper are not good for wrapping around fingers. But you see the dose says 40 to 80. The Empty allows you to go up to 80. Some pharesers only allow you to go up to 40. So when you're doing your antiphoresis, you're not getting full bang for your buck. You know, you already bought the patch for $12. And you're buying the medicine, it's your time. I would want to go as high as I can. So I use the analogy of a pitcher of water. And I use this for my patients to understand it. The dose is how much water you're putting in the pitcher. Okay? The intensity where it says 0 to 4.0 is how much I open the spout. So the intensity is only going to impact how long it takes me to pour out all the water. I set the dose. Okay? What do you think could impact someone's ability to pour the water out quicker or not as quick? Any thoughts? Uh, no, not that. What about, what's different between both your skins? Hmm? It's porous. No. They both have porous skin. Do you dehydrated or something? Or less our skin. What's less different? Well, I'm older, mm -hmm. but so I do have less elasticity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dark complected. Do you sunburn easily? Do you yeah. sunburn easily? <laughs> I do not. I get really tan, right? So people that sunburn easily have less ability to tolerate this electric current going through their skin. So you might have to open the spout more slowly, 
which would take them longer to get the dose. That's why they use like specific lasers for people with darker skin. I know because I also have an olive complexion. Yeah. Darker. Yeah. And when I have had laser stuff done, they have to use like it's advisable, they said, to use a special one. But like if you're African American, for example, right. definitely. Right. Your skin's just very different than someone who's very light complected or red hair, right? Um, so what I do with my patients is if I saw you in the clinic, okay, I'm starting you at 40 because you're very light skinned. I think you're probably going to sunburn easily. And I'm worried that you might have a skin reaction. If you do, then you can't do it again, right? Versus if I had Mark, I'm starting him at a 60 dose because he has more, he has skin that's going to tolerate things more, right? Because I want to, I want to give my patients as much benefit as they can get. And then I up it every time they come in until I can hopefully get them up to 80 dose. Because I want as much water in their pitcher as I can get. And so if I use a Pariser that only goes to 40, I'm shorting my patient. All right, that is it, you guys, on um, itises. Any questions? Are you guys spent? They were here four hours last night, Mark. <laughs> I don't know how you guys do that. <laughs> What's good though about it is when I mention things today, you remember, because we just talked about it last night. When I talked to the other group, we talked about it the week before or maybe the week before that. Yeah, so there's pros and cons, really. You know? So, do you guys want to, so we're next moving on to nerves. Why don't we take a lunch break? I know it's not noon yet. So you're okay with taking lunch early? We have to eat breakfast so early. So, you guys ready for lunch? All right, how long do you guys want to take for lunch? Here's what I think we have to do yet. Nerves, which will probably take two and a half hours. And then I want to cover the...